Okay, it looks like we're all ready. It's my honor and privilege to be introducing our three speakers today. Some of you from the professional side may have heard um, one of our speakers. So um, today we have uh, Dr. Terencio McGlasson. Um, Dr. McGlasson is an associate professor of counseling education at Central Mi Michigan University. He holds a PhD in counseling and master's degree in both counseling and theology. Dr. McGlasson's clinical experience includes residential care, family prevention services, addiction counseling, directing two university counseling centers and a private practice. He was also a disaster mental health responder for the American Red Cross in 2012. He was deployed to New York after, in the aftermath of Hurricane Sandy. His 16 years of clinical experience inform his expertise in the classroom teaching courses focused on professional practice, a qualitative scholar, his research, and writing interests focus on existential and humanistic approaches to counseling, LGBT advocacy, and spirituality. He recently had an article published in the Adult Span Journal focusing on the mental health needs of those diagnosed with Parkinson's disease, and he facilitates the Mount Pleasant Area Parkinson's Support Group at MSU. A biracial man with extensive cross-cultural experience, he has been a civic volunteer, mentor in major urban centers, worked in, with the Blackfeet Nation in Man Montana, and served abroad as a consultant and humanitarian worker in India, Nicaragua, Brazil, and Peru. Dr. McLesson frequently presents at regional and national conferences and has spoken to audiences on the West Coast and across the Midwest. Please welcome Dr. McLesson. Are you exhausted after the introduction? <laughs> Thank you. Well, it's wonderful to be here with all of you. Um, professors are uh, renowned for being long-winded and in love with their own voices, so I have a timer for my portion of the uh, presentation, and it is now started. Uh, it's wonderful to be with you. I am not an expert in Parkinson's. In fact, I was thrust into this world. Some of you who I've met before know I was thrown into this world three years ago when my little brother Jamie uh, was diagnosed with early onset at the age of 43. Um, and I realized after 16 years in clinical practice, I knew virtually nothing about Parkinson's disease or neurodegenerative disorders, and we received no training as licensed professional counselors on how to deal with such issues. In fact, when I was preparing to write my article for publication, I, the best I could remember, I only dealt with one instance in 16 years of someone with a neurodegenerative disorder, and that was Huntington's disease. And so, as often happens, when our lives are personally touched by something, all of a sudden we're thrown into not only an interest, but an advocacy. And that's why I'm here before you today. My expertise is in the mental health realm. Uh, so there are a few things I want to share with you. I was asked to speak about a holistic approach uh, in regards to mental health, uh, a holistic approach to care, and as well as the possibility of some barriers that may be out there. So I've got just a couple minutes to toss some things out to you, and I hope that it will be helpful. At the end of each of our presentations, we hope to have lots of time to interact with you with questions and answers, because uh, hearing your voices is much more important than hearing ours. So we'll be back up to answer your questions. Uh, I want to read you a quote from uh, my article. Um, a 2002 study uh, of more than 1,000 individuals with Parkinson's disease and their caregivers across six countries. More than 1,000 people living across six different countries in this study found that only 17% of respondents' perceptions of their own quality of life. So of these 1,000 people living in six different countries, only 17% of those people, when they thought about their own quality of life, said that it could be explained by the severity of their disease and or the effectiveness of their drug treatment. 17% said that the quality of their life could be explained by the severity of the disease or the quality of their treatment. So what do we do with the, the rest of those folks? 
Uh, according to Finley and Baker 2002, this finding represented a wake-up call for healthcare providers. Increasing the numbers of neurological specialists alone is not going to suffice. They emphasize the critical importance of effective communication and the well-being of clients with PD. Now, I want to be very clear from the get-go. I'm a mental health counselor. That means I'm warm and fuzzy, and I get into emotions, and I listen, and I talk, and I have, we have breakthroughs, and it's all great stuff. There's a place for that, but nothing I'm going to say today, it want, I want to be construed as suggesting that the more traditional neurological approaches, including pharmacology, are not important. They're absolutely essential. My little brother, if he were here today, would say the same thing. What I want to suggest, and what I believe my colleagues want to suggest is, is in addition to the neurological issues, in addition to uh, the medications uh, for the trimmers and such, we also need to take in the whole person that includes their mental health and well-being. And like any other area and demographic in our society, oftentimes mental health needs of people are not stated. They're not paid attention to because there's a stigma attached to that in our culture. And so what I hope to do uh, by standing before you is to say, this is an important issue. And for those of you who are diagnosed with Parkinson's, if you are struggling with depression or anxiety or um, an uh, depression, anxiety, or apathy, or if you know someone who is, that's really, really important that we speak to that part of who they are. So what do we talk about when we talk about a holistic approach to treatment? Well, it could include many things that you are already aware of. We talk about things like relaxation exercises and meditation and yoga. We know, many of you know about the big and loud approach. Uh, boxing, exercise. We know about things like sleep hygiene and behavioral uh, strategies to deal with fatigue. And even, uh, I think, uh, increasingly being accepted are spiritual approaches. For those of you who are people of faith or consider yourselves spiritual individuals, studies have shown going back decades that people who have a profound sense of their own spirituality or faith oftentimes indicate lower levels of depression and anxiety. And there's no reason to believe that that should automatically change simply because you have Parkinson's. So if you were a person of faith, we want to draw on the strength of that faith in your life to help you to cope and manage with those symptoms. We know most of those. But what I want to talk to you about this morning in particular is the sense of connectedness. And that's where the Michigan Parkinson's Foundation really comes in and they're brilliant. Because for everyone in this room whose life has ever been touched by a support group, you know exactly what I'm talking about. I'm new to this as well. Somehow I, I met um, Debbie Orloff a couple years ago and you know she literally is a human tornado. And if you come within proximity of her, you get swept into the vortex of what is her life. <laughs> And I initially called to ask about a walkathon, and the next thing I knew, I was facilitating the support group in Mount Pleasant. And I didn't know for sure what had happened, but I thought, oh, she's good. She's really good. So we are just finishing our first year with the restart of the Mount Pleasant Area Support Group at CMU. We are the only university in the state of Michigan to host an MPF support group. And let me tell you, we are quite proud of that. Um, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> If we have uh, anybody from the U or from MSU, sorry, we got the head start on you there. <laughs> Great stuff happening there. We're small, but we're getting word out. But what I have realized as a psychotherapist sitting and watching, facilitating this group, is how people are encouraged when they're in the presence of others, particularly when they feel heard and understood. Any of you who are part of a support group, especially a smaller one, knows when folks in that group are struggling, it, we feel it, all of us feel it. And we, we are a very small group. There are about five or six of us that have been diagnosed and their caregivers. And over winter break, we had several people who had been hospitalized for numerous issues. And we all carried that burden and felt it together. And then uh, a couple months ago, one of those folks who had been in the hospital for an entire month, she came back and she was doing better. And there was just this sense of rejoicing in the room. We were all so excited about that. We are designed to be um, relational people. And when we come together and feel heard and we feel safe, we do better. Now that's the support group model and most of us are aware of that. The other piece that I want to talk to you about is the mental health counseling model because oftentimes we haven't had exposure to that. That's my area of expertise. That's going in and sitting down with a mental health professional and talking and sharing 
and rejoicing and crying over the experience of what it is to have Parkinson's disease. No, we don't have some kind of Jedi powers to read your mind or dig deep into your primal psyche. That's not what we're there, we're there to do. We are there to listen and to support you in any way that we can. Any qualified good mental health counselor will tell you that we do not have a solution to Parkinson's. No one does. So what, do, what good does it do, Dr. McGlasson, to sit and just cry about it or sit and get angry about it? Because if we keep all of those emotions inside, they're like toxins in our system. And oftentimes what I have found is, is that folks who have been diagnosed with Parkinson's disease and or their caregivers are trying to guard and shield each other because they don't want to be that burden. If I have Parkinson's disease and I'm really struggling and I'm really depressed, I might not want to share that with my caregiver because I already feel like I'm a burden. If I'm a caregiver and I'm discouraged and scared, I might not want to share that with my friend or my mate or my relative who has Parkinson's because I might be afraid that I might pull them down. So what do we do with those emotions and those feelings? Oftentimes we just repress them down inside and they don't go anywhere and we know that's not healthy. So what counselors can do is provide you a safe environment. People who aren't your friends or your pals or people who go to your church, that anonymity is actually a real sense of comfort. You're not in any other area of my life. I have no worries about depressing you because you're trained to listen to this. So I'm going to come in and I'm going to dump. And when I leave, I'm going to feel lighter. Now, I want you to know that I have always taken my own medicine. I've been in this profession for over two decades. I still see my own therapist in East Lansing at least once a month. And I'm always amazed when I'm driving down there, having trouble thinking about what am I going to talk about, and then an hour and a half later, I'm thinking, where did the time go? Because life builds up on us. So I promise you, I just wanted you to know that I practice what I preach. Um, I'll come back around to the mental health piece in a second here. Uh, but I want to talk about potential barriers to getting mental health care when it comes to Parkinson's disease. And just a few things that I'll jot down, uh, I'll give you if you want to jot down. First of all is the idea of missed diagnoses, M-I-S-S-E-D. And I spell that because I'm going to have a play on words in a second. Missed, missed diagnoses. There are uh, multiple studies that have been published that indicate at times as much as 40 to 60% of people diagnosed with Parkinson's disease also have clinical depression but are not diagnosed with that depression. <coughs> Let me say that again. There are multiple studies that have been published that indicate that sometimes upwards of 40 to 60% of people with Parkinson's would qualify for clinical depression but their doctors are not diagnosing it. Does that mean that they're being treated by quacks? Of course not. These people are experts in their field, but they may not be experts in, in depression. That's not necessarily their field. And what also happens, we're finding in the literature is, is that people assume if you appear to be down or blue or even clinically depressed, there are many folks out there, even in our professions, that assume, hear me, that it's a reaction to the disease. Now that seems to make sense, doesn't it? But the data doesn't seem to prove that out. Just like someone without Parkinson's can be diagnosed with clinical depression, people with Parkinson's can also be diagnosed with clinical depression as a separate diagnosis. Is it hurtful? Is it painful? Is it a struggle to have this disease? Of course it is. But we don't want to overlook that and dismiss the presence of depression because of the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease, because both could be present. Let me tell you real quick about what my brother's experience has been like. My brother deals with apathy. He struggles with a flat affect. And he on my urging, went to see a mental health counselor, and I'm thinking, oh good, he's going to have someone to talk to. The counselor tried to convince him that the apathy was actually, figuratively speaking, in his head, and it was a coping mechanism because he didn't want to deal with the reality of Parkinson's. When my brother pulled out a peer-reviewed journal article that I sent him, indicating that this was a neurological disorder, the counselor didn't know what to do. And unfortunately, he wouldn't budge, and my brother fired him promptly, and I'm very proud of him for doing that. Yay! These are real issues that are bearing down on us. And the thing is, is that it, we don't have a cure, but we need to be able to see it, to detect it, and to address it. So one of the barriers is misdiagnoses altogether. The next barrier is misdiagnosis, M-I-S, 
D-I-A-G-N-O-S-I-S, misdiagnosis. And what we're talking about there is, is what I just mentioned, that we see these, the depression and the anxiety is simply a response as opposed to a neurochemical disorder in and of itself. So we have misdiagnoses and we have misdiagnosis. Another one that we have a real problem if we have professionals in the room is the DSM prohibits us from diagnosing someone with a major depressive disorder because it's due to a psychiatric, it's not due to a psychiatric issue. The very clinical book that I was trained in will prohibit me from diagnosing that or prohibit professionals from diagnosing it because it has not allowed for clinical depression to be comorbidly diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. So now the book that I'm supposed to be using to register a code to get you insurance reimbursement won't even allow me to give you that diagnosis. We have room to go there. One of the other ones that I noticed when I was down talking to the advisory committee uh, for MPF is that a lot of the neurologists are not aware of the role that licensed professional counselors and licensed clinical social workers play. Many of the neurologists in the room with me that night said they're familiar with psychiatrists and they're familiar with psychologists and they stay with those folks because they don't know for sure what LPCs and LCSWs actually do. And there's also um, a myth out there that these folks can't bill for insurance and can't get reimbursed. So if you have Parkinson's disease and you've mustered up the courage to go and say, I want to talk about my depression, but you have, feel like you have to pee out of pocket because you heard that your insurance won't cover it, we're nowhere. And so it's such a privilege, scary, to sit in an entire room with neurologists and say to you, guess what? Licensed professional counselors, licensed clinical social workers, we're out there. This is what we do every day. And increasingly, we can bill your insurance so you don't have to pay out of pocket. And then finally, one of the barriers sometimes are the patients and the caregivers themselves. There is no stigma to being depressed and anxious, but our society doesn't quite got that down yet. And so oftentimes when we're struggling with that in internal darkness, that shame, we attach stigma to it and we don't want to say anything about it. Study after study indicates that depression complicates Parkinson's symptoms. Depression complicates somatic physical Parkinson's symptoms. So it makes sense to me if you're depressed and struggling and if we can address that, the whole picture gets better. Now I'm going to stop there and turn this over to my colleagues. I'll be back around if, if you have questions for me later. But the one thing I want you to walk away with is to realize depression, anxiety, and apathy with Parkinson's patients could be a reaction to the diagnosis, but it also may be a separate clinical diagnosis. <laughs> There's my alarm. <laughs> I'll step off. Thank you. How's that, huh? Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> I'm really proud of myself. <laughs> so are we. <laughs> right to the minute. Okay. Our next speaker, Dr. Dori Ann Espiritu. Dr. Espiritu is the interim chair of the Henry Ford Behavioral Health Sciences and service chief of psychiatry of the Henry Ford West Bloomfield Hospital. She is a board certified in both adult and geriatric psychiatry. In addition to her administrative role, she maintains an active practice seeing adult and geriatric patients in the outpatient setting and in long-term care settings as well. Dr. Espiritu finished her psychiatric residency in adult psychiatry at the Henry Ford Health System and then went on to do a fellowship in geriatric psychiatry at Wayne State University. She's a member of the Professional Advisory Board of the Michigan Parkinson Foundation and is also a member of the Grassroots Advocacy Philippine Medical Association of Michigan. She has received numerous awards, including the Henry Ford Health System Shadow of the Leader, the Dr. Joseph Ponca Caring Physician of the Year, and has been an Our Detroit Top Doc in Psychiatry since 2009 to 2015. Dr. Espiritu's special interests are issues in geriatric psychiatry, dementia, successful aging, behavioral self-investigation in primary care, non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's, 
and spirituality in psychiatry. Let's welcome Dr. Espiritu. Hello, everyone, and um, thank you again for um, coming to the symposium. Um, really heartwarming to see a lot, and um, that <coughs> this is, you know, it was full capacity, and we're, you know, um, we didn't even have enough room, but because of your enthusiasm to um, learn more about the disease, and you are here, and you're very patient. Um, it's hard to follow doc, uh, Dr. McLassen's um, motivational speaking. <laughs> I feel like I, I, I don't need a timer because I, I won't really um, uh, spend the 15 minutes, uh, minutes of uh, my time to talk. I would rather, you know, um, uh, be part of the panel and then answer questions. This morning um, I talked about uh, depression and anxiety. Um, so, um, this afternoon, I will talk more about the be other behavioral um, symptoms that happen in Parkinson's disease. But Parkinson's disease is, um, we know, is a primarily is primarily um, a movement disorder. Um, but the high prevalence of psychiatric complications really makes it a neuropsychiatric uh, disorder. And um, the aspects of um, Parkinson's disease, the neuropsychiatric aspect really represent an important clinical challenge in optimizing the quality of life of patients and, of course, the caregivers. Um, how many of you here are caregivers? So that's really half, you know, um, the uh, uh, people in this room, and, and really it, it's a dyad. You know, it's a, it's a, the disease is not just the patient. Uh, symptoms, but the whole families. It, it takes uh, um, a whole family to uh, cope with this disorder. So um, the dim this dimension of the illness frequently accounts for a substantial portion of the distress, and so we really need to, I mean, even the burden um, of this disease. And so, you know, every treatment needs to include the caregiver. Um, a lot of times, or, or every time I see a Parkinson's disease patient, the caregiver is always there. And half of the session is I would change the direction and look at the caregiver and say, and how are you? Because I don't believe that I will be able to fully help a patient without working with the loved one. Um, so. Uh, Mood symptoms, depression and anxiety, are, are very, very common. More than 50%, uh, depending on the setting, uh, would have anxiety and depression. And I won't have a lot of time to talk about that. But I wanted to just go over some other um, behavioral symptoms. One of them is loss of impulse control. That is when a patient becomes disinhibited. In social settings, someone would just blurt out something that's totally outrageous and out of context, which causes embarrassment to the loved ones who are with the patient. Um, so that is part of the disease, not as common, but if you see it, it you need to think about it as part of the disease. It's not that they just want it to be one cocky, you know, uh, macho, you know, someone, you know, trying to say something uh, out loud in a restaurant. Um, sometimes you just want to think it's the brain. Um, you know, and, and sometimes, you know, that alone will, will help um, you to cope with that. Um, it is uh, most commonly re reported behaviors with loss of impulse control would include gambling. Very, very devastating to families, obviously. We've, we've seen patients who were put on uh, dopaminergic agents who were so frugal and saved all their lives. All of a sudden, they were at the casino 24-7, lost all their savings. Divorce happens at 60, 65 years old. Very, very traumatic. Um, they need to be reported immediately if this happens. Um, so, 
it's not just gambling, sometimes it's hypersexuality. All of a sudden, someone who has been so straight starts calling some 1-800 numbers and starts going and meeting and having a date uh, with someone. Um, again, you know, very, very hurtful to a very loyal relationship of for 50, 60 years. Um, medications can help. Sometimes, uh, uh, you know, just discontinuing the medication that led to this behavior will itself um, solve the problem. But to be courageous to say this is not right, to go to Dr. McLassen and say, you know, something is going on, I need help with this, you know, sort of thing, instead of just letting it go until, you know, it's irrepar it, the damage is irreparable. Um, one of the other uh, behavioral problems is increased emotions. So you've also seen that. It's also called pseudobulbar affect. Um, so it's associated with a lot of neurologic problems. So there is a distinct change from how the patient was before the illness. And the patients, um, even if they don't feel sad, they all of a sudden just boo-hoo, like nonstop crying. Or even in, like I had a patient who um, went to granddaughter's wedding, can't stop crying. Taking pictures, it was a happy occasion. But, you know, this whole, you know, rush of emotions happens and it becomes embarrassing sometimes because sometimes they ha uh, happen in social situations. Um, watching TV, something really meaningful, something really impacts, you know, um, uh, the story is very impactful. They start crying or laughing. Sometimes it's even inappropriate laughing and you know, it goes on and, you know, uh, loved ones don't understand what's going on. Um, but that is also very related to the neurologic uh, problem in Parkinson's. Um, again, it just comes out of the blue. Um, so, you know, a lot of times it's just wait until, you know, it's over, they laugh, and then, you know, talk about it and, and try to divert the... Uh, um, uh, attention to a different issue altogether. Other behavioral disturbances, uh, obsessive behaviors, um, sometimes they're not the obsessive compulsive disorders that you see in younger uh, patients. Uh, some examples um, are, uh, well, this is more of the funding now, uh, funding P-U-N-D-I-N-G, are you guys aware of what this is? Okay, so um, this is the intense fascinating, fascination with assembling or disassembling equipment or sorting and arranging buttons, objects. You know, I had a patient who assembled and disassembled, assembled, disassembled the bike. It takes forever. Patient was doing this 12 hours a day, unable to stop. Um, again, a lot of times it's uh, connected to uh, a dopaminergic agent that was started. Um, you know, sometimes there was no history of all, at all of obsessive compulsive disorders, but you know, all of a sudden um, this uh, behavior happens. Impulse control di disorders uh, we already talked about. There are drug-seeking behaviors in some patients. Uh, some patients who start um, dopaminergic agents, all of a sudden they like the, the rush. There's, it's not really a rush, but you know, the, the instantaneous motor you know, release or you know, they feel better and so they take more and then they become hyperkinetic and then they take more and you know, the next thing you know, you know they're on two too much, too high of a dose. So um, it is important to be educated about these because again, like we said, you know, they have very, very serious um, consequences. There are a lot of other behavioral problems, uh, but I also wanted to um, say a little bit about caregiving because a lot of you are here. Um, 44 million Americans provide support to older people and adults uh, with disabilities who live in the community. Most, most caregivers are women. 
surprise, surprise, look at the room. <laughs> Majority of you here are women. Uh, most are over 50 years old, which makes it even more difficult because you yourselves have your own medical issues going on as we age. And, and so this makes it even a, a more difficult uh, situation. Half are still employed. So that balancing out between caregivers and um, you know, caring uh, for your um, loved one at home uh, becomes very difficult. Key findings in caregiving, they show high levels of stress and frustration, uh, high levels of depression. And again, it doesn't need to be a major depressive disorder. Sometimes you know, it's a subsyndromal depression, um, just the caregiving in itself. And acknowledging that you're having a hard time doesn't necessarily mean you don't love your spouse anymore or your family who has the Parkinson's disease. It, it's just this difficulty of taking over two lives, yours and um, your loved one. And, and sometimes they say, you know, when, when, when I ask a, uh, a caregiver, like, uh, what do you do for fun? Or what's your relaxation? Oh, I bring a book when I go to the medical doctor. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I should have. Um, okay. Uh, I thought that I, <laughs> I didn't need a time. I'm sorry. I didn't. I thought I didn't need a um, timer, but anyways. <laughs> so, um, um, in 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 summary, then then you know we, you can ask me some questions about uh, caregiving later. But um, so emotional changes are very common. Um, depression and anxiety the most common, but there's also other behavioral problems. Uh, the range of treatment options is greater than ever before. Unfortunately. There's not a, a lot of good studies in terms of medications that can help with depression and anxiety, like solid studies. So I am not a pill pusher. I always want to make sure first that we clean up the patient that I see instead of adding on another medication and then referring uh, for therapy. Caregiver assessment and support should be a part of the assessment. I cannot overemphasize that and that there is help available. Sorry for you know, the longer time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, I just told Dr. Spear, too, that yesterday I was seven minutes over on my talk, too. Well, we want to move along because we want to leave time for your questions, because your voices and your questions are the most important part of this day. It's a special privilege for me as an RN to introduce Denise Van Etten. She's an RN, a nurse coordinator at the Michigan State University Movement Disorder Clinic, and is an active member of the Michigan Parkinson's Foundation Professional Advisory Board. Denise has taken an extremely active role in educating people with PD, both as a clinical nurse and at the Michigan Parkinson's Foundation, orienti Orientation to Parkinson's and Living with Parkinson's courses. Please join me in welcoming a nursing colleague to speak to you today. I'm, I'm taking a cue from both my colleagues, and I'm going to put my little timer on. Uh, I'm coming from the other perspective, coming from the clinic, the physician's office that's trying to deal with these issues. Uh, and the difficulty in um, designating both anxiety and depression within a fairly short visit um, that's really focused uh, very much on motor symptoms, because that's what we have great treatments for. So I want to kind of point out uh, how easy it is to miss both anxiety and depression in our patients, as most of the symptoms that they express in regards to their anxiety and depression are actually expressed as their motor symptoms or worsening of their motor symptoms. So it's not uncommon uh, that both of these things uh, will filter together and make it all the more difficult to uh, regulate these things. And I'm going to start by reading off some of the symptoms of Parkinson's. And I think that uh, my colleagues here will, will also designate that these are very common symptoms of depression as well. Uh, increased difficulty with activities of daily living. Increased tremor or a sense of internal tremor. Difficulty walking. Freezing. Increased stiffness. Slowness of movement. A lack of facial expression. Reduced movement of mouth and facial features as well as other parts of their body. Decreased emotional expression. Fatigue, 
sleepiness, memory problems, and decreased attention. All of those things are non-motor types of symptoms, motor symptoms of Parkinson's, but also overlap and are often the way that these other problems are designated and related in a person's body. So not uncommon for our brain to try to cope with changes that are occurring in neurochemicals and finding an outlet that isn't always the way we anticipate or expect a depression or an anxiety to present. So we may be anxious about something and our stomach hurts. We may be achy all over, or we feel very sleepy and want to stay in bed. Um, so designating and sorting out depression and anxiety is much harder than you would think in the clinical setting, where again, our focus is on motor symptoms. So there are a few cues that can help us a little bit, um, and I think sometimes we err. Um, and certainly have erred many times in the past in treating our patients more so for their motor symptoms. Um, and you'll see why as I express these other uh, things that kind of point out people who may have anxiety or depression. So patients who are anxious or depressed are more likely to request their Parkinson's medications early. They're going to experience more severe on and off fluctuations. They have increased dyskinesias and restlessness. And their physical exam doesn't match the perception of that person with Parkinson's and how they're doing. So maybe we, in our particular clinic, we do a unified Parkinson's disease rating scale, which is a motor scale. We look at how people are moving. And um, like a golf score, lower scores are better. Um, so we look for nice low scores. So we get someone who's got a large list of complaints, can't function during the day, can't get myself out of the chair. Um, but when we do their score, they're about 11. And that doesn't really match up with the level of disability they're talking about during the day. So as healthcare providers, we need to be more in tune to recognizing possible cues in their motor symptoms that might lead us more down the line of saying, you know, there could be some anxiety or depression that's causing some of these issues. And I want to uh, kind of end on a happy note. Uh, both Dr. Espiritu and I uh, share a patient. Um, and uh, she has been a long-term patient. We haven't had her that long, but she's had Parkinson's for quite a long time. I uh, was seeing a previous neurologist uh, came to us, and we have kind of gradually gotten her on medication. She had some bad experiences early on, um, <clears throat> a lot of side effects that made her very hesitant to start medications and to improve. Um, we were not really getting very far, kind of raising up her meds very, very slowly gradually getting some things on board, but very, very masked, very slow, very stiff and rigid whenever she was in the office and always kind of required assistance. Uh, we encouraged her to see Dr. Espiritu, uh, who talked about many things, including a couple of different medications. Uh, she came back to our office, said, you know, we talked about these things, but we didn't really start anything. And, you know, she did have kind of anxiety features. It was pretty easy to see that she was quite anxious. And admittedly, she felt anxious as well. And I'm like, what are you waiting for? Why don't we try something? Let's put you on a medication. So we put her on duloxetine. I think she started the medication. and I don't even think we increased it. I think we started her on the lowest dose. Um, and she was to follow up with me a couple of months from that time. Um, and her husband could not wait. Uh, he <laughs> called me. <laughs> said, I need your email. i got to send you something. So uh, going from this person who barely was able to move in our office, he sent me a video. And I'm looking at it, and I'm thinking, this can't possibly be the same person. She was dancing back and forth, picking her feet up, <laughs> tapping her hands, when in the clinic she was barely able to move. So uh, it's very clear that there is quite an overlap with anxiety and depression in relationship to motor symptoms. And again, as clinicians, we pay attention to those motor symptoms, and maybe we sometimes overtreat and give them more medication than they need because we're missing the cues for the anxiety and the depression. And with that, I will end. All right, and I did start my timer late, but I still have four minutes left. <laughs> All right, we're going to open the floor to questions. I have a microphone. If you feel like you need it, just go right ahead. I would like to know if there is, um, I'd like to know if there's some correlation. My husband seems to need a lot of sleep. He gets up in the morning 
does a few stretching exercises, might eat breakfast, and then the next thing I know, he's laying down in bed for a few more minutes, watching another half an hour of TV before he gets motivated to get up and get rolling to work. But is that part? Of, is this fatigue part of the Parkinson's? Is it part of the medication? Is it a, a low part of depression? So I don't know how to how to label it. I don't know whether it's just something that's going to be. Is it tied in? I'm going to jump in on this one if my <laughs> colleagues don't mind. Um, it's difficult to sort out those issues. Yeah. So uh, many things can cause sleepiness and fatigue. Uh, certainly fatigue is common in Parkinson's as in depression, sleepiness, and sleeping a lot also. Um, I think one of the things to really pay attention to is, uh, is he sleeping well? Is he waking frequently during the night? Is he staying up late? Is he um, managing good sleep hygiene? Um, does he have any sleep apnea? All of these things are important to kind of filter out uh, before we just automatically assume that it's either uh, Parkinson's fatigue or even depression. Um, if he's waking up and he doesn't feel refreshed, it's feasible that he has sleep apnea. It's very common with Parkinson's. So a sleep study may be needed to sort that out. And other lab tests like a thyroid, uh, other types of metabolic changes can also cause these issues. So having a good physical, getting the lab work done and making sure that there's not any metabolical condition first is the most important thing to hit, I think. Yeah, and, and after you've ruled out all the stuff that yeah. um, Denise um, talked about, um, you want to ask um, or, or pay attention to the motivation because that then would speak more of the depression. Um, you know, uh, one of the cardinal symptoms of depression is the lack of pleasure um, in things um, and the lack of motivation. Um, so if he is disinterested, doesn't want to do stuff anymore, just sits, you know, and, and again, it's not an excuse, but it's like, I'm tired. But ask about those other symptoms that would, you know, trigger more discussion about depression symptoms. My question is about dementia. So how frequent is it? At what stages do you see it? And what helps? Any mind exercises, anything else that we can do? Yeah, well, um, there was a really good lecture this morning um, on cognition. And um, number one, um, in, in terms of bradykinesia, which happens in Parkinson's disease when there's slower movement, there is also slower speed of processing. Um, so a lot of times we think, well, there's bradyphrenia, that's what we call it, and so maybe that's just what it is. You know, patient is just a little bit slower in terms of thinking because everything slows down in Parkinson's. But what um, the speaker um, said this morning is actually they saw a huge number of uh, patients who had mild cognitive impairment to begin with. Um, in patients with Parkinson's. And so it, it's, it's common, but it doesn't present as Alzheimer's disease. You know how it's, a, in, in Alzheimer's is a slowly progressive decline. Um, in Parkinson's disease, it's, it's memory is not quite of an issue unless it's Lewy body uh, dementia, which is, you know, a Parkinson's plus dementia and all other symptoms. Um, so it is common. Um, it presents differently. Um, not quite as Alzheimer's disease, but uh, we still use the medications that we use for Alzheimer's disease, um, Aricep, Exelon, um, and uh, Exelon has the, the most uh, uh, research uh, done on it. Yeah. Okay, thank you. If you have um, symptoms that you're talking about with these side effects from Parkinson's, besides the physical ones, how do you get help for them? And the second part of that, without somebody just handing you more medication. Well, I can start, and I'll, I'll pass it off. I, I'm, <clears throat> my folks, licensed professional counselors, licensed clinical social workers, we uh, often are not the front line. Usually it's your primary care physician or your neurologist. And what I would suggest to you is that you, we must get to the point where we find our voices and advocate for ourselves. These, most of these physicians are fantastic at what they do, but they unknowingly develop a very narrow focus because they're specialists. And it's really important that we stop these folks and say, 
I'm struggling and this feels different than what we've been working with, or I'm concerned that my mood may be declining, or I just don't feel like myself anymore, <clears throat> make sure that they hear you. And most, most doctors, they're caregivers. They just, they're busy and, and they're incredibly intelligent, but most of them are gonna stop if you stop them and listen. And a good doctor, a good neurologist is then going to make a referral. Um, I would, I would tend to work hand in hand with folks like Dr. Espiritu, and you heard her mention that. I would want to work with a psychiatrist or psychiatric nurse practitioner to, uh, with the meds, and then in turn, I was so pleased to hear her say that she would want to refer that patient then to me, because the, ind the research indicates that the combination of antidepressant medication and talk therapy has really excellent results, but it has to start with each of you, and oftentimes, I must say, it starts with nurses like Nurse Van Etten, Nurses will be in that room listening to you when the doctors are flying back and forth from their you know, triple book client load. And so if you can't get a doctor to listen or if you're intimidated by the doctor, grab the nurse and say, I think that there's something else going on here. Can someone listen to me? And ask for a referral to a mental health practitioner. Is there anything you want to add to that? <clears throat> I think it's helpful to uh, not, ne not necessarily have your neurologist have the ground floor. Don't let them run your office visit. Yes. And I think the first step you've taken is being out here today to get educated, to understand things better. Um, the first thing I'd really recommend is when you go to the doctor's office, you have a list and you prioritize because your neurologist is going to be looking at one or two things because they have a limited period of time. They're there with you. So if you want to talk about depression and the socio aspects of dealing with Parkinson's, then you need to prioritize that and say, I understand, you know, the motor symptoms are there, but here's my priority today. What can we do about this, this, and this? And I think that, you know, medicines are sometimes necessary, but there are a lot of other alternative approaches, and really to get the best effect, it's best to have medication as well as therapy. Um, and other types of treatments. Uh, certainly we try to aim to keep medication lists as minimal as we can um, and add medications only as necessary. And, and okay. I was going to uh, also add oh. that, um, you know, it, make sure you um, see a, psych, um, a, a medical doctor, your primary care is part of a big system in a multidisciplinary yes. clinic. Because what happens is if they're one sees, you know, they're, you know, there's a little clinic there and then their primary care is there and the site, a neurologist is, you know, to uh, 15 miles away, that's very difficult to coordinate the care. And Henry Ford, um, the chronic, uh, patients who have chronic diseases, um, are being asked two depression questions as part of the vital signs. So, you know, we're not just doing your blood pressure, your heart rate, and, you know, um, your other vital signs, your weight, but we're also asking two depression questions. If you answer one to one of those, which is the PHQ-2, it opens up to PHQ-9. So it, it, you can't miss it. <laughs> you know, your MA will say, you are depressed, you need to see someone or you need to talk to your primary care about it. So. Well, my question is on the other end of the scale, how about a kind of a hyperactivity uh, sense in Parkinson's? Does that ever exist? It's kind of like going from one thing to another, to another, to another, to another. Um, so I'm not quite sure that I, I, I don't know if you're talking about impulse types of aspects or if you're talking more about um, just doing things. The, the inability to kind of stay on one task or just kind of keeping busy? Just keeping busy all the so, time. Uh, so I, I don't know exactly how to relate that to Parkinson's per se. I'm sure that there is an aspect of it, but I think that there are certainly uh, patients that I take care of who are used to being independent and doing their own thing, um, and they very much do those types of things, and it's very chronic that the daughter or the son will come in and say, you know, mom shouldn't be doing all of these things. She shouldn't be climbing up on the ladder and cleaning the cupboards every day and all of these other tasks. So I think some of it's a little bit of personality in uh, the person with Parkinson's who uh, was always kind of busy, never really sat down, was kind of the whole, I ran the whole place. Um, I don't think that ends just because you develop Parkinson's. Um, but I think that has to do with anxiety? There could potentially, I suppose, be anxiety, but I guess it's a matter of deciding is this different from who the person was before they were diagnosed with Parkinson's. If it's a, a personality trait that they've had all along, I wouldn't blame Parkinson's for that. 
Okay, we have just like one minute more while you fill out your um, evaluations and you can turn them in outside. You find the appropriate table. But there's a young lady who was asking, had her hand up for quite a while, so I wanted to give you a chance to ask a question, you bet. Um, just with the stigma of mental health and seeing someone, I was wondering what you would say to the caretaker and the person with Parkinson's to get, what are the benefits of going to see someone to get the, encourage them to go? Yeah, I'll take that one. Hey, uh, I, I would say the same thing to anyone who is considering seeking out mental health services. We all deserve to be heard. We all deserve to be regarded, uh, to have a safe place where we can go and just uh, talk, to share, to let our emotions out. And it's totally understandable why we are afraid to burden each other. That's why I love the role that I played when I was in clinical work. Let me be that person. Come and dump all this stuff and then go back home feeling a little bit lighter. But what I tend to do is I tend to normalize it and say, whether you have Parkinson's or not, whether you're a caregiver or not, all of us benefit from having some place where we can go and someone to listen to us. Uh, so I, I just think, I think all of us should be in counseling, quite frankly, but <laughs> that's just my bias. <laughs> well, I, well, I think this has been a wonderful session, and I hope you enjoyed it and learned so much. It's time for us to say goodbye. I would love you to say a special thank you to the three of our panelists. <laughs> And it's been a pleasure for me to be here, too. Thank you so much.